And Flockery will hit this, and it's dipping! Oh, my word! Sergio Flockery has produced a worldie to put Spal 2-0 off. The Cultural Guys is a weekly podcast by Adriano DiNardo, Gianni Delacoli, and myself, Nicholas DiGiovanni. We want to bring Cultural back to its roots in our communities and share stories from around the world about why we're passionate about the beautiful game. You can listen to us anywhere where you listen to your podcasts, including Spreaker, Google Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Mixcloud. Give us your opinion on social media at The Cultural Guys on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. The intro song is Fireworks by Jazz. Another week of absolute madness in the city. Uh, lots of uh, important games, important results for the battle for Europa League. Uh, Another week with the with the Calcio guys, with Adriano DiNardo, Gianni Delacoli, I'm Nicholas Di Giovanni, and right off the bat, we have uh, we have our guests this week, all the way from uh, from Parma, Connor Clancy, a journalist for Forza Italian Football. How's it going? Quite buzzed after tonight's Serie A game, so I'm generally quite well, thank you. <laughs> so, so you're in Parma. What? What we normally do with our guests, a lot of our guests are are, are fans, and we normally ask them, you know, um, you know, how come you're a fan of that team? But I want to ask you, obviously, you're, you're from Ireland. What led you to Italy, to, to covering the Serie A? Um, honestly, I started watching, I had always watched a little bit of Italian football growing up, and then I started watching it a little bit more religiously around probably 2010, 2011. Basically, the reason for me taking an interest in Serie A was Zlatan Ibrahimovic. And mm. then yeah. I just kind of became a little bit obsessed with all of the little stories and the other clubs and eventually kind of latched on to Atalanta as the club that I support in 2012 or 2013 and kind of decided we were building a bit of a, a team of people out here in, in Italy to kind of go to the games every single week and I made it a priority to get out here as soon as I could. So I finished my studies, saved up for nine months and then moved to Italy and that's pretty much it. What's it? What's it been like in uh, in Parma so far? Oh, that's nice. I mean, the food's amazing. The weather is horrible. Uh, <laughs> like in in winter and summer, the weather is awful. But that's just the Piano da Padana in the north of Italy. You can't really complain about that. I knew what I was getting into. But other than that, I mean, Parma's a cute little city. The quality of life is quite good. The people are okay once you've infiltrated, and then yeah, it's it's nice. I can't complain. Yeah, so um, Connor, so you, you speak about uh, you know Atalanta, the team that you know you support. Uh, obviously, now uh, like everybody does know, you, you know you cover you cover Parma. Uh, what if I, if we can ask, what led you to specifically Parma? Uh, I know maybe they are an intriguing team, a historical team. What led you to uh, to the, to the Crociati, as they call them? Yeah, well, I was I was drawn more to the the location than the football team, to be to be honest, because. If you, if you, <laughs> Take up a map of Italy, right? You've got Parma, and last season and this season, Emilia Romagna was the the most well represented region in Serie A. So, if I live in Parma, I can go to three, two, three games every weekend, minimum of two. Um, Parma home games every time they play, I'm there. And then Sassuolo, Bologna, Spal tend to be my next stops, as well as Florence for Fiorentina. And then it, it's also quite easy to get up to. To Milan, especially good now that Atalanta played the Champions League games there, and even Brescia and Verona aren't too difficult to get to. So it was sure. a geographical decision more than anything. But then, I mean, the romance of Parma's comeback, the first team to ever get three straight promotions, returned to Serie A after what they'd done in the 90s. It was, it was kind of an easy decision to make when all of these factors came together. Yeah, beautiful. And uh, considering Parma, like now themselves as a team, uh, especially how they're finally back in top flight competition, uh, how do you think Roberto De Versa, Like, do you think like he's really got a big influence on that? Like, do you think he's he's the biggest reason why, or do you think maybe the team themselves over the years just got better? I think the Versa is huge, and it's quite interesting here in Parma. Like, I spoke briefly with with Nick like before 
we we arranged to do this and he asked me about how how he's seen empowerment and people don't really talk about him and to be honest mm. i think that's probably yeah. the biggest compliment he can be paid you know he's he's just Very part underrated. of the furniture. yeah that's that's exactly it it's not it's not that there's a coach and a team it, it's that parma or just this one thing you know they've they've got leaders on the pitch in bruno alves Uri Kutska and I, I was going to say Jovino, but I'll stop short of that. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and Diversa is just the perfect leader for this team. He has them playing a, a style that suits every single player in it, with the exception of probably Caprari. But other than that, everyone just fits together so so well. And I don't think you can credit that to anyone other than Diversa. You know, he came in in what 2016, having only ever coached Virtus Lanciano before that. And yeah. he's just taken them up. And they don't look like they're going to stop rising at the moment either. When he took over in 2016, you could not have told anyone that in 2020 they'd be challenging for the Europa League with Milan and possibly Napoli. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, one of our questions that we got from our, our friend Joseph from uh, Cultural Fan Blogs, it's a two-part question. Uh, and you kind of touched on both of them right there. Uh, first part, he asked, do you like the versus tactics? So you talked about his style, how it, um, uh, you know, it, it suits every player. Uh, you know, mm. what about that style suits every player? And then do you, he, he asked, do you think a Euro, um, Parma will qualify for the Europa League next season? Uh, well, sorry, th- does he mean will they finish high enough in next season Serie A or will they qualify through this season Serie A to make it? I believe this season, I think yeah, he was talking okay. about. I don't know. Um, I, I think he they can, a, but I don't think they question. will. Unfortunately, uh, to the to the Europa League part, it's possible, but I don't think they will. Yeah. The results since the restart just haven't quite been good enough, even if the performances have been quite decent. Um, and then the first part, the versus tactics. It's I'm um, I'm a real sucker for a four three three. Basically, <laughs> if if teams don't play with three at a back, I only want them see I only want to see them play four three three. Nothing else. Like it's all I'm kind of interested in. And, it works perfectly. It, it's got this flexibility, and it, it's based off of Bruno Alves at the back, just doing everything, being a machine. Just he's he's a freak of nature. And then when he has the ball with his feet, his distribution is phenomenal as well. He's one of the best passing centre backs in Serie A, I would say. Um, last season, I had like a, an individual campaign for him to get a move to any big club who needed a defender, but it didn't come to be, thankfully. <laughs> And then in midfield, you've just got these guys who who just fight and fight and fight and then just let the forwards kind of do what they're good at, which is being quite fast, quite tricky and just being as direct as they possibly can. And everyone in the team has a role. Everyone knows what their role is, even players as talented as Dejan Kuluzewski, who's been, I mean, incredible this season. I've been waxing lyrical about him since... (laughs) <laughs> Probably since last June when the Primavera final was played in Parma and I went and he was one of the best players on the pitch for Atalanta and I was delighted when he when he then signed for Parma because it meant I was going to see him every week and since his first appearance against Juve at the start of the season I've been bigging him up and every time I see him he does something that I've never seen him do before. He just <laughs> keeps getting better and a lot of the Parma players are doing similarly. Juraj Kutska in midfield is one of the most underrated players in Serie A, I would say, and Bruno Alves at the back, along with Castro Dermacu, who's only played, I think, 10 times in Serie A this season because Simone Iacoponi has been preferred as Bruno Alves' central defensive partner. And personally, I think Dermacu's twice the player Iacoponi is. So if, if De Versa can, can agree with me, I, th- I think Parma's defence will improve <laughs> from what it is, which is already the sixth best in Serie A for for Palma, that's not too bad a record. Oh, absolutely! And uh, you know, talking about Diversa, you got you got to get this uh, recording to Diversa uh, as successful, well, Connor. That's for sure. Um, but going back to what you were saying about you know the forwards, um, uh, we want to you know we want to touch upon that as well. You, you spoke about Kurzewski. Uh last week. We we had high uh, high praises uh, for for another forward in uh, in Cornelius. Uh, what do you just make of their you know their their performances so far this year? Uh, obviously, you know, Cornelius, uh, you know, in the double digits uh, for goals and Kulzewski, like you said, you know, just week in, week out. He just, you know, uh, a spark, a spark of brilliance. Uh, what do you make of them uh, and just, you know, their, their attack uh, in as a whole? I'd have loved to have seen a season pan out with 
uh, Roberto Inglés a fit because yeah. I, I do think he's their strongest number nine. Uh, he's definitely, he would have been their first choice had he stayed fit throughout the season. Cornelius is a player who frustrates me greatly because obviously <laughs> having seen him quite a lot with Atalanta, you, you see these glimpses of someone who could potentially be a fantastic front man at one of the the clubs competing for European places every season, but he just doesn't have the consistency. One thing he has added to his game in recent seasons, which I think saw him leave Atalanta, was that he didn't do enough when he didn't have the ball. This season with Parma, he's added that to his game, um, which is probably down to Diversa, going yeah. back to that. Um, but no, I think their attack, their, their central forwards have, have left a lot to be desired in the last couple of years. And then with Inglese being injured this season, once Cornelius is fit, is unfit, sorry, or he can't finish a game, the options off the bench aren't exactly that strong. So they've got good forwards, but not good, not great strikers. And I do think Cornelius is an incredibly frustrating player. He shows it against Genoa that he can be good, <laughs> but then against everyone else in Serie A, he kind of flatters to deceive more often than not, unfortunately. Yeah, like especially that last game where he had some brilliant opportunities and he just couldn't finish it. Mm. But and but his teammate, which is a former Roma player that I've missed dearly, but obviously you guys are taking advantage of him, Gervinho. It's crazy how he joined the team in 2018 and he's just been uh, a great piece for you guys. Well, I find he's been a great piece for you guys. What are your thoughts about Gervinho? I disagree. I, really? I, yeah, I think for the first two months... <laughs> I, I would right have up, agreed with up. that. I, I would have agreed with that completely for like September, October of the 2018-19 season because Gervinho came back to Italy and it's like everyone forgot how to defend against him because he just runs, right? And he runs really, really fast and he's confusing and he's kind of intimidating when he's doing that like run forward where you kind of get the feeling he doesn't really know where he's going so how can a defender? But the greed... Every time you see him play, the greed just gets the better of him. And he'll be in a position where he's beaten a man twice and he has the option to square it to one of three options who each have a pretty much open goal. And Javinho will try and beat the man again and, and go himself from a terrible angle. And it's I'm not exaggerating to say there's at least one one example of this every single week. Every time I watch Javinho play... He wastes an opportunity that would be a goal if he passed it and he doesn't, then he misses. And for someone who is supposed to be one of the leaders in the dressing room, you know, we've seen him wear the captain's armband when Bruno Alves isn't been fit. I I just think it's criminal for him to get away with that. Um, Thankfully, the issues he's had with the club and he's had with the Versa and his teammates appear to have been, well, not quite resolved, but brushed under the carpet until the transfer window reopens, probably. So he's doing okay again now, but I would expect Javinho won't be here at the beginning of next season, and I think Palmer will be better off for it. So going to the other end of the pitch, uh, Luigi Seppe, he's had a pretty good season so far. Uh, We have a question uh, from Twitter from uh, the Calcio podcast, another podcast here in, uh, in Montreal. Uh, They asked, uh, where does Seppe rank uh, amongst the current Serie A goalkeepers? I saw this question, you know. It was a two-part question, I think, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, hair, the, hair, the hair question. Okay, okay good. The good. hair question. If you want to answer that, if you know the answer to that, Connor, uh, feel free. Well, I, I investigated. <laughs> um, Excellent. And it, it doesn't look like he's he's had a, a hair transplant, but... Yes, yeah, so, so I, the, for our listeners, the he question He always was, shaves did, his hair. Did Seppi get a hair transplant or did he voluntarily shave his head uh, bald pre-Parma days? I was going to... I was. I wanted to do the serious question first. But uh, oh, there's, but, there's no but time Connor for that. Come on, always go with the jokes. Always go with the jokes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> nah, Sepp is, Sepp is still shaving his head. Uh, I've had a look. I've taken some photos up and zoomed in on the hairline, and <laughs> the, the hairline is actually receding, which is which is proof that the hair transplant has not taken place. So I don't know if that's breaking news, but it there might you be. Go. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of Sepp as a, a Serie A goalkeeper, I think. He's one of the most improved players in Serie A this season, if not the most improved player, because 
last season he was a joke. He couldn't do the most simple of tasks. And then he would pull off this remarkable Spider-Man save into the top corner. Whereas if the ball gets passed back to him, he wouldn't be able to control it and he would put his team under pressure. Or if a ball came into the box, he wouldn't be able to catch it. Or if there was a shot straight at him, he'd move out of the way of it. He, he was a complete mess last year. and I don't really understand how or why Palmer kept him, but they did. They, they obviously saw something there. And this season, he seems to have ironed out most of those issues. I still don't completely trust him when the ball's at his feet. And when there's a cross coming to the box, I still half expect him to make a mess of it. But he hasn't done it this season. And I think he's improved greatly. I still don't think he's one of the best goalkeepers in Serie A, but he's twice the player he was last season, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I think like 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 the Versa uh, Sepe is, is another just one of those underrated, uh, you know, under the radar kind of uh, players or goalkeepers in this uh, in this case. Uh, you know, that just kind of goes unnoticed because you know he plays he plays for Padma, and and like Connor said, uh, you know, he doesn't. Or, or I mean, you know, Padma doesn't get you know the maybe the exposure uh, that maybe they should. So, uh, but quickly moving on, Connor, I uh, also wanted to ask you. You touched upon it a bit before about you know the whole Europa League uh, after you know. If uh, if this year is is a possibility, uh, so currently they are in uh, Parma is in tenth at thirty nine points. Um, again, do you think that you know it would be better off to maybe finish outside the Europa League spots and maybe come back stronger, uh, you know, after the transfer window uh, next season to try to qualify? Or uh, what are your thoughts about you know trying to make Europe? I think that's a dangerous game to play. Um, okay. If if they were going to try and like wait. For next season to have a stronger squad because there's no guarantees, especially sure. given how the the economy and football in particular is going to be hit by the the pandemic, right? Um, so I've spoken to people at Parma at basically every level, like coaches, people upstairs, and players as well, and they maintain their focus now is survival. They're only thinking about staying in Serie A. Once that's mathematically done. They'll start thinking about other things. They're not opposed to the idea of Europe, but at the moment, it's not something they're thinking about, no matter how many times I question them on it. Amazing. So insider trading right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's have a bit of fun here. So let's do something a bit, uh, a little bit off course and uh, just something about Serie A in general. Do you think Juventus is going to get another Scudetto this year or do you think Lazio can actually overcome that little four-point deficit and actually win it. I would love for a team other than Juventus to win the Scudetto. Out of boy, Connor. Out of boy, Connor. <laughs> That's it. You like this guy. I, I kind of next time. <laughs> I kind of have to qualify that by saying that it's not because I hate Juventus. So don't don't start coming at me, people, please. I get enough <laughs> hate from Milan fans on Twitter. I could do with any of fans joining in. Oh shit. Um, are you guys you in Milan fans by any chance? Yeah, I am. I, I, Adrian, Adrian, I, yes. Tell your tell your tell your boys to back off, please. <laughs> Yo, I was gonna tell you to back off us. I don't know. Man. Um, but no, I would I would love to see Lazio win this Scudetto, but I don't think they will. Before the break, I was backing them, and I thought they would do it. I think the break came at a worse time for Lazio than it did for anyone else, and I I think Juve will be fine now. Though they'll do enough. They won't impress between now and the end of the season, but. They'll do enough because they know what they're doing. Chiellini will return and they'll get another Scudetto. Next season, it'll be Atalanta's though. So it's another yeah, issue. Yeah. Oof. That's, what, that's what's reporting, yes. <laughs> if <laughs> if Lewis Muriel says that, it's good enough for me. That's it. <laughs> Connor, I'm not surprised uh, Milan Twitter is attacking you. They're, they're ruthless sometimes. Milan Twitter, yeah. most, the most active fan base I see, to be honest. They're yeah, really they're cool. basically the Arsenal of Serie A though right they're nowhere near as good as they used to be and their fans are taking it personally oh my god (laughs) the attacks (laughs) no it's all love it's all love (laughs) but uh but Connor um uh another question just you know just kind of came kind of came up uh up you know you're you're speaking about Mercato you know there's there's not a lot of guarantees and you know obviously with this whole pandemic there's really no guarantees um what do you what do you what do you think the you know the you know Parma's weakest weakest points uh, are in the squad and where should they you know they go come Mercato 
if it's not this Mercato coming up, uh, maybe the next one after that, uh, where do you think they go? They need creativity because other than Kuluzeski, they don't really have it in the team and obviously he's leaving. Um, yeah. Whether or not he'll be loaned back or loaned somewhere else, it remains to be seen, I guess. There's a chance of that. But yeah, they, they need to replace Kuluzeski. How can you replace him? I'm not sure you can because he's one of the best creative players in Europe at the moment. Definitely one of the best creative young players in Europe. And Unless you're going to go and sign someone like Papu Gomez, I don't think <laughs> he can be replaced. And Parma can't attract that. So their best hope is probably by navigating their way through loan systems and trying to get another kid in to do similarly. Maybe, I don't know, they've got a good relationship with Atalanta, going for Ibrahim McCauley or Adama Traore, or not Adama Traore, Ama Traore. It might yeah. be the worst place to go. But yeah, I, I think Parma will struggle a little bit more for goals and certainly for chances next season once kudoszewski has gone. Other than that, I think Parma are quite well stacked. They're, yeah. they're, they're not going to have any major problems. Yeah, you, you kind of mentioned uh, before the relationship between Parma and uh, Atlanta. Do you, do you know why? Do you know if there's a reason why the two clubs have such a good relationship in terms of transfers and loans? I don't actually know, but the relationship has strengthened because of the whole stadium thing as well. Because obviously earlier in the season, Atalanta couldn't play at home, so they used the Tardini for their first two home games. And oh, I cool. know everyone at Parma was very impressed by how Atalanta. Um, dealt with the stadium even the the ultras left a scarf at the um Matteo Bagnarese memorial beneath the curva and wow. the Parma ultras released a statement to say thanks for this touch of class you've strengthened their relationship so it's a relationship that is is growing at club level and at fan level so it's going to be quite interesting to see how that develops over the next couple of years and uh Connor we got a bit of a personal question for you here from uh <laughs> Dov Schiavone Ah, uh, he's yeah. not, has he? <laughs> yeah. He wants to know what you're doing Saturday. <laughs> so what's, what's the big plan Saturday, Connor? Uh, I think this is just him trying to get me to plug the fact that we're going to games again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> on, on Saturday, I've been approved for going to Reggio Emilia for Sassuolo Lecce, and then we're awaiting approval for Parma Fiorentina on Sunday as well. Beautiful. Uh, How's it I'll been in the, in the stadiums? Um... Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to avoid just saying it's weird because everyone knows it's weird, right? Yeah. But I went to Inter Benevento in the Coppa Italia last season, which was also behind closed doors. And yeah. with that being at the San Siro, that was that was really, really strange, like beyond describable. It was so surreal. It didn't feel like I was actually there. It felt like an out-of-body experience at times. Um, but then coming to the Tardini, because I know it so well, and I've I've been in there for other reasons when it's been empty, but obviously not for football games. So it it didn't feel quite as strange. The the one thing that really struck me was when the players were coming out like one by one. That was a little bit unsettling. And then they still announced the goal scorer in the way that they usually do when Javinho scored, and that was kind of funny. And listening to the players and kind of hearing their accents, like the players that you don't get to speak to, like Bruno Alves and stuff. Hearing him speak and shout was, was quite interesting. Yeah, it's it's been different, but I'm very much looking forward to a time when I go and I can hear the fans singing again, to be honest. Yeah, I think it's just a, a whole other... I mean, like like you said, everybody says it's weird and, um, you know, cultural or just football, soccer, whatever you want to call it, is not the same without the fans there. And, and I think, uh, you know, we, we've seen it now, obviously, with uh, these games behind closed doors, but... I think, you know, uh, you know, slowly, slowly, I think, you know, like you said, hopefully, you know, we can get back to, you know, a time where, you know, fans can be in the stadium. But I think that is just a, a waiting game for that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you'd hope so. Anyway, I, I think the next season is looking good. I mean, the situation, touch wood, as it stands in Italy, is good. It, it feels good. It feels better as well. Um, there's a good atmosphere around the place. So I'm very, very hopeful that by by next season, maybe not quite september but october november why not fans fans could make a return i hope yeah and i i think that you know at one point the government said you know we got these big stadiums you know like the biggest stadiums mm. are 60 to th- uh, 60 to seventy thousand people you know it you, you could get a couple of hundred thousand people in and, and keep a distance so it'll be interesting yeah. to see how that uh plays out is it in denmark i've seen i've seen that being done where basically every 
fourth or fifth seat is occupied and the rest of them are empty and it looks yeah, weird yeah. it's a bit alien but i think it's it's a way forward and yeah. the thing about it here in italy like people are gathering anyway people are going to bars and stuff like the the social distancing thing is very much reduced now so i think it's possible to reopen football stadiums in some way like if you've got a block where there's normally 100 people put at least put five people even in it you know and yeah. get even 100 fans at a match it makes a difference yeah, I think it's a it's a it's a work in prog like you know it's a work in progress. If I totally agree with you, uh, you know if you let in if you start letting in like a certain amount of people and then you know maybe a couple weeks later you know it's 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 more people and then you know eventually it's because it, it's it for me it's more like if you if you build it up it, I would think it would be better than just to have like a shock and just have everybody back at the stadium come whenever September or whatnot. So. Yeah. Um, I think mm-hmm. I think you know it's 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 definitely a thing that obviously you know we haven't really seen before per se uh, for this long uh, you know this long period of time. So I think it's still like a, a trial and error type of type of situation. Anyways, yeah. That, so, sorry, uh, did you have something uh, so, to say, Connor? So Connor, it, no, no, I'm done. Uh, so Connor, just before we let you go, uh, a big big thank you. Uh, you know, from all three of us here, uh, you know, for you taking your time out of uh, your morning, out of your day, uh, you know, to speak to speak to us. Uh, you know, we really do appreciate it. And uh, before you let, we let you go, uh, where can uh, all our listeners uh, find you? Yeah, well, head over to ForzaItalianFootball.com for, as we were kind of alluding to a little bit earlier, match reports, analysis, yeah. <laughs> opinion, everything you could possibly want on Italian football from from Italy, from inside stadiums and stuff. So I think... That's something that we're really, really trying to push these last two seasons is that every weekend we are at at least three games at the moment. And in normal circumstances, we go to six or seven games every weekend of the 10. So, yeah, follow us on Twitter at Serie FFC and just look up for Italian football. You should be reading it already. (laughs) Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, Connor. Uh, Thanks thanks for having me on, guys. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Stay safe and uh, enjoy the games this weekend. Perfect. Cheers. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Salamak is on the charge and he has been all day. It's turned in! Disaster! It's the captain, Francesco Vicari and Spal are heartbroken. So, welcome back to the Calcio, guys. That was a slow burn by... Kevin McLeod, I think the perfect song for um, both of your teams this weekend, both Milan and Napoli with Adriano Donardo and Gian- Gianni Della Colli. I'm Nicholas T. Giovanni. Um, Adrian, we're going to wait for you. I want to start out with Gianni. Gianni wasn't here last week, and today, both Napoli and Roma lost. On the yes. weekend, Roma lost to Milan. Napoli, thankfully, won on the weekend, but... Um, you know, I want to for I want to focus more on on Roma because Napoli. You know, okay, whatever. It is one loss to Atalanta. They had a good restart. Um, do you think it's panic? Uh, do you think it's panic time for Roma at this point? Uh, well, there has been a lot of uncertainty up in the air with Roma, even though they had a good start to coming back. It's um, there's not much security in the team right now. I thought honestly that things were going to be better, but uh, they haven't been. And uh, today the red card didn't help. Um, unfortunately, I was at work, so I didn't get a chance to see today's game. But I am pretty sure it was probably the same thing as the Milan game, where there was they just came out with a very flat performance, and they just uh, they guys just didn't want they didn't want to win. Uh, could it be something behind closed doors? Maybe. Can we say for sure? No, but um, there's something that needs to be rejuvenated in this team right now. There. If, especially with these flat performances, they need to find some kind of motivation again. And it's weird because they have Napoli right on the right on their heels. So unless they want to not try to qualify for uh, make up that push for 
uh, Champions League, at least try to stay in that Europa spot. Um, I, I saw a post on Twitter actually from Joseph from Calcio Fan Uh Like, it, do you think the blame is on Palotta at this point? It, it's just been the past few seasons. You know, they, at one point they were challenging for the Scudetto when they had you know Salah and and uh, Nangolan. They, you know, they had Allison as their starting goalkeeper for for one year. That Chesney. You know, do you, do you think it's on the the owners at this point? Uh, could be. Like, it seems like he's probably being a bargain hunter, but not trying to do it properly. We've had this discussion many, many times before that he yeah. treats it like an American business, which uh, technically the soccer team is a business. It technically is. But if you're going to keep constantly sell your assets just to keep a profit, no one's going to come to your games anymore. It's like it's going to be the expo situation where the expo is just used to develop talent and then sell them just to make money. Eventually, people are just going to stop going to your games, and now you're going to have no income at all to buy new talent or new players and whatnot. So unless uh, something changes, it's this is just a bad sign for, for things to come for Roma. Yeah, and I also think, you know, the performances on the pitch also, you know, adds to that too, right? So it's, you know, Palotta's been in the news now, like Nick said, you know, these past couple of seasons where, you know, he's kind of maybe dropped the ball. Like, I mean, listen, we don't, we, we are across the pond. We, we can't say for sure, but, um, you know, maybe, you know, he's looking for, you know, to, to kind of maybe get out of it, uh, get out of Roma. And uh, he says he wants to put in, you know, in good hands, uh, whoever does potentially buy them. I, I don't know. But uh, like you guys said, you know, if you're selling off, you know, the likes of, you know, Alice and Nangolan and, and, you know, all these Salah and all these other players, you know, and the performances on the pitch aren't, you know, coming anywhere close to what you were it's kind of a hard pill to swallow. So, I mean, I think, you know, Roma's in a sticky situation at the moment. Um, you know, is it, you know, is it, is it going to be a new era once, you know, Poeta's out potentially? I, I think that is the idea. But, um, you know, when, when you kind of, uh, you know, run out uh, the, the, the legends and the likes of, you know, De Rossi and Totti and, you know, the, the, the kind of friction that was there with Totti, it, it, you know, it's, it's very sad to see for Roma fans and just, you know, cultural fans in general because, you know, for our generation, you know, the Totti, the Rossi, those, those were those are like idols to, to a lot of you know to a lot of us. So um, it, it, it's sad to see, uh, you know, as a neutral. But I could just imagine uh, for the Roma fans. And then for Napoli, I mean, okay, they lost today, but they they lost to Atalanta. Atalanta is a big yeah. loss. Yeah, it, it is it a is big loss. loss. Um, you know, but uh, you know, it, it's not a spirit dampening loss. I, I think no. I think Gattuso was a bit frustrated at the end of the game. You know, based on how I saw him at the end of the game there, but uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah, be- because today's loss was really attributed to two stupid uh, mistakes. Like, it wasn't as if, um, like, yeah, like Atalanta did pour it on, but it wasn't as if Napoli, like, they did straight up beat Napoli's defense. Fa- uh, Fabian Ruiz, I don't know what the hell he was doing in the box when he had that ball that caused the first goal. And on the second goal, uh, that was all on Di Lorenzo being way out of position, which is rare to see from him. Yeah, so, he's been fantastic. Yeah, so it was just um, it was just something that was just a bit out of the ordinary. But uh, you have to give credit to Atalanta; they have eighty-two goals in the four right now in Serie A, and they're basically super close to beating uh, uh, Napoli's record, and they're already like almost top five all time for offense. Crazy, yeah. yeah. Had a, even had a big win on the on the weekend against Udinese. Morial to strike it. It is oh, yeah, yeah. a it's perfect a, a clip, finish. Sorry. Another you... former Udinese striker scores past the Zebrete. And Gomez trying to turn Strega Larson inside out. Morial, oh my word! Simply spectacular from Luis Morial. Little technical difficulty there, as you heard my voice <laughs> over the phone. Yeah, Muriel, what a game! Um, but I want to go to you, Adriano. Now, Milan sure. on the weekend. What? What? You play oh my God. second to last place team Spall. They get a red card around the what thirtieth minute, I believe, pretty early on, and you you needed an own goal right at the end to tie. What, what, Imagine what happened, that. especially after just beating Roma, beautiful game by Milan after just beating Roma two nothing. Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, totally, uh, you know, totally, just you know, pissed off. I mean, like, listen, like you, like you, you just said it. Um, you know, after a big win, a big win, uh, you know, coming obviously the big win against Lecce, 
But, you know, we, when we were speaking about that, you know, it only is Lecce. They had Roma next. Uh, they got the job done, which I was super pleased about. And, uh, and, and a clean sheet on top of it against, you know, uh, you know, a team like Roma that has been, you know, above me on this season. And just o- yesterday, uh, obviously here in Canada, it was Canada Day. So uh, I couldn't really watch the whole game because of other commitments. But uh, I did catch a bit of it and just total disappointment, total, uh, a total shame. Because now we go into the month of July where I spoke about it probably about a couple a couple episodes ago where you know I could just I would just hope they get out of July alive because they have the likes of Lazio, Juve, Napoli uh, to come just to you know just to name a few uh, you know big big games uh, coming up and this game was a, was a game that should have been a lock uh, you know like Nick said um, you know the last uh, second to last place team Spal uh, and what happens they give him they give Milan trouble Milan goes down two nothing and thank the Lord that they even picked up a point out of this game it was just totally ridiculous obviously you know you know fan i saw fans after on twitter with the whole uh, handball situation on chionic or, or sionic whatever however you want to pronounce his name um listen, listen and no var call i'm not even gonna get into that just because I, i'm gonna blow up if i start talking about var and handballs and bullshit VAR. like got, that small got a red no on the handball at the end of the bah. game bah. the handball at the end of the game I- Adriano, if, if, if you need the, if, if you need to, no, to, I'm not saying I'm not saying that should have you know that should have been the, our savior. That the, they they play like crap. Now I know. But if you know the, these things are in place to correct the game and to make the game better, like we've been saying it, or like everybody has been saying it, and it's not used when they should be, that's where the problem lies for me. Not to say that Milan deserved the game in any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it was, as I said, totally pissed off, and I think that, that they should be ashamed of themselves. And you know, now we go against Lazio come Saturday, and uh, you know, you hope for the best. Obviously, you know, Lazio is going to be missing some pieces, but um, I, it's just a total shame. And you know, this is going to bleed into my yellow card, red card later. But uh, yeah, just a total shame on, on Milan's part. Okay, breathe, Adriano. Breathe. You're you're here. <laughs> you're almost as hot as it is outside. Oh my God, it's muggy as hell outside here, Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> um. Did, did you guys see what I what I posted on our uh, on our Instagram or Instagram and Twitter yesterday? Yeah, of course. Yesterday, of course. Yeah, the uh, the, the 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 many dile- the dilemma of uh, I would assume it's the dilemma. Yeah, the decision. Yeah. I, <laughs> the decision. It was either <laughs> go outside and enjoy a nice holiday or stay inside and watch six <laughs> games. But b- both of you, both of you guys took the uh, took the go outside go. decision, right? Yeah, pretty much. I try to do both. I try to do both the best <laughs> I could, but uh, it, it was a hard decision to make. Yeah, I mean, both my make. teams played today, and I had to work, so I only had to catch the highlights for the half the game. <laughs> Roma That's didn't good. upload didn't upload the, that one yet, but uh, so I took advantage of having the day off yesterday and uh, enjoying the nice the nice weather and a nice yeah, barbecue. Yeah, so you can't blame me. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, about social media, we have a really good yeah. question from Pizza Calcio. Uh, nice. It goes with both of you guys, uh, so it's two parted question. Um, I want to start. You know what? I'm just going to okay. ask Adriano this quickly. Do do Milan deserve to be in their spot in the table right now? They're in seventh, forty three points, one ahead of Verona, and uh, two behind Napoli. Do you think they deserve that spot? Well, listen. I think. Um... The, it, you know, if it wasn't for yesterday's debacle, like I said just earlier, I think they should have been tied with Napoli on points and and maybe be in that sixth spot. But um, it's it, it, I th- I think it's I, I mean I expect them to be higher, but at, at the rate that it's going and the, seeing the competition around, I, I don't see them being anywhere you know further down the table. Like maybe in like eight nine, but like even at that, I I, I still think you know the seventh spot is kind of their realm, and I'm hoping for Europa. So. I'm going to say, you know, they, they, do they deserve it on every week, every performance? Maybe not. But if, if we start talking about deserving and, and, yeah. and placements at the table, it, it's, you know, with many teams, we can say, you know, they don't deserve this, but, you know, they got the job done, you know, and, and they're in the spot that they're in. So I, I think I, I'm going to go with yes. But uh, in that realm of Europa, you know, seven, eight, uh, I, I would say uh, at the moment and obviously striving for, for higher uh, come, come the future. And and Jenny, so the second part to the question, uh, I like this. I, I really do from Pizza Calcio. How many Milan players would start on the current Napoli squad? <laughs> well, <None. laughs> I mean, actually, no. I mean, you have Zlatan. I mean, I know Zlatan's yeah. not a starter, but you can you can argue that him. And honestly, any left back like Theo, Theo Hernandez can replace <laughs> Maru Rui yeah, yeah, any yeah. day of the week. 
<laughs> and you know what? I I wouldn't mind Romagnoli over Manolas. Uh, Manolas, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean, like it, you, you'd be an fair, idiot fair. to not choose out of the two between Romagnoli and uh, Manolas. You'd be an idiot to choose Manolas. Like as much as I appreciate what he does for Napoli and what he did for Roma when he played for Roma, like Romagnoli himself is just he's got talent wise is far beyond what Manolas has. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, that, that, that's that's pretty fair. And then obviously Donnarumma. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> oh, Donnarumma. Oh. this what? is true. No, no, I'm not going to argue you Donnarumma agree? versus. Yeah, oh. of course. Okay, okay, well, of you course. Could, you could say no. No, 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 no. Yeah, no. no. I, 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 I was would surprised. Choose, you said yes, <laughs> I would choose Gigi over Murray. Mar- like as much as I like okay. Murray, what he does, I would choose Gigi. Okay. I, I, I have a preference to Italians too, but I mean, <laughs> mind you, yeah, Murray yeah, is yeah. A pal- I'm such an idiot. Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Azuri fan Phil ain't gonna be too happy with you out there. Oh, yeah. Azuri fan Phil's gonna lynch me on Twitter now. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Can we just edit this good. out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all good. Um, I'm, st- I'm, th- I'm thinking about the Manolis and Romagnoli argument. Sorry about that. Uh, and, uh, no, it's all good. So, Juve, Juve played 3 uh, nothing. They beat Genoa. Three amazing goals. I'm just going to play the clips now. Dybala, wonderful balance, wonderful poise, and a quite wonderful goal. A goal that has been coming for a long, long time in this match. Options left and right. Cristiano Ronaldo, though, goes for goal and finds it spectacularly. Oh, my goodness, what a hit that is. Irrepressible, irresistible. Team who is starting to look a little weary. What about that? What about that? Well, we have seen three exceptional goals. Douglas Costa wraps his foot around it. Alexis Sanchez. So you heard uh, you heard there, so Dybala, Ronaldo, Costa. So there's not much to t- actually talk about the game. I just want to talk about the goals. Three amazing goals. And on, on Twitter, a lot of people are debating who, you know, which goal is the best. I want to ask you guys from a, from a soccer point of view, which goal did you guys find was the best? Uh, do you want to go first, AG, or I go first? Well, I mean, for me, it, it's a bit of a toss-up. Um, I, I, I don't know which route you're going, Johnny, but I, I was gonna I was debating between either Dybala or, or Costa, for me personally. Um, I mean, Ronaldo's goal, like, don't get me wrong, you know, fantastic goal, but uh, it's kind of something that, um, you know, he's just, he's just a freak of nature, right? And, you know, he's just, it's not, I'm not going to say it's expected that he scores those types of goals every, every week, but, you know, to see that from him, it, it's kind of, you know, uh, okay, you know, great, you know, he, he scored another beauty, but, you know, Dibawa, uh, you know, as, as we spoke last week, uh, you know, with, uh, with our, fa- our fantastic guest, uh, Daniel Lucci, uh, you know, talking about Dibawa, you know, kind of MVP conversation, and obviously we got a bit of, a uh, bit of a conversation after we posted that, but um, yeah, listen, uh, you know, Dybala, fantastic player, and Costa is another guy, you know, he, he, who, uh, you know, there's times where he's on, there's times where he's off, but again, he's one of those players when he's on, he's on, and uh, for me, both personally, it, it was a toss up between those those two goals, uh, you know, just you know, Dybala, you know, uh, twinkle, I think the game against Genoa, twinkle toes in the box, and you know, he he slots it past the former teammate Perin, and I don't know, Perin must have felt like uh, total shit after the after that game, but. <laughs> I mean, what, what, you gonna, what, what are you going to do, you know? But, uh, yeah, for me, like I said, a toss-up between uh, Dybala and uh, Costa. I'm probably going to have to go with the Ronaldo goal. If I'm not mistaken, that was the one that was the screamer one. Uh, yeah. yeah. From the long distance. And I, and I freaking love those kind of goals. Like, honestly, they're, they're so nice to see, especially the power that the ball picks up. And if a goalie who is not expecting it or is slightly out of position, you know, like it – they're not going to save it. And then there's times where goaltenders, like, they could be in the best position possible, but the shot is so well placed. And, uh, I, I, like I said, I've always loved those type of goals, so I'm going to have to probably give to Ronaldo for the scoring the most beautiful goal that game. So, Adri, so since you, you uh, let's say, let's let's just give uh, the Dybala goal to you. I was a huge fan of the Costa goal, personally. Like, um, yeah. after the first two goals, uh, the commentator said, you know, oh, uh, who, whose goal was better? And then Dybala, uh, Costa came out with that one it it was, it was just the, the shot the shot itself how it it kind of went high up and dipped i, I love that goal beautiful to see the first time ever that dibala ronaldo and douglas costa scored in the same game um obviously since the last time we did this two match days in the city uh, there were a lot of uh, different um different uh headlines Calidi, they uh, they won on the weekend against torino then they drew against bologna they've suddenly got themselves back in the Europa League conversation, um, Simeone, by the by the way, he's the first ever City A player to score in every month of the season. 
I'm sure there's gonna be a lot more players that are are um, that are uh, gonna you know do that now. Sorry, every month of the calendar year because City has never played in July uh, and yeah. he scored on July 1st. You know, it was pretty easy to do. Um, He's also scored yeah. four uh, the last four games, I believe. No, yeah, he scored four yeah. games in a row. Um, uh, Galladini scored. Inter beat Brescia 6 nothing. <laughs> Brescia just awful, awful team. Terrible. Big performance by Inter, though. Big performance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on uh, match day 28, by the way, uh, Bologna beat Sampdoria away. The last time they did that was March, 20, March 29th, 1998, when uh, Mihaj- uh, Mihailovic actually played for Sampdoria. And now he was coaching uh, Bologna. <laughs> it was a game where uh, Vincenzo Mont- Montella and Verone scored for Samp. And then there was a hat trick from Kenneth Anderson, a player I've, ne- I've personally never heard of. But, you know, great for him back on March 29th, 1998. Uh, Bologna did that. Johnny um, uh, Petania scored against his future team uh, two matches ago. He didn't celebrate because he knew he was going to join them in, uh, in the <laughs> fall. Uh, that, that's something you don't see too often. Yeah, but I mean, I guess because he just wants to still demonstrate that he is a valuable asset that they went after. Uh, I, like I said, I've never really big on Patania. I'm still not that big on him, even though that he will be a future Napoli striker. Um, he's going to have to, because I just don't like the fact that he's he's always seems to be the type of striker, which is not a bad thing to be in the right place at the right time, but. I don't think he's got that much natural talent, but mm. who knows? But but maybe if he's got a nice player on the wing with him, you know, it's going to be great for him. But uh, it, yeah, it's it's not something you see often. I wasn't I wasn't really angry at all because I'm like, okay, yeah, it's good for you. You're you're doing your job. You're scoring goals. It's kind it was kind of funny to see though. I do have to admit that that was, I it was think, very. I think I think you know, like you said, Johnny, if if he can get. The service, like uh, you know, if it, if it's Insigne or whoever it is, you know, giving him those balls, I think you got, you got a you got a, a big time scorer up top. That um, if it's not Mertens up top, that you know Petania can come in because you know Milik is either injured, off, or when he is on, you know, he, he does perform. But I think you know the light up, you know, they call him the bulldozer, uh, Petania up top, and I, I think he can be that guy up top that can score a lot of goals. I mean, I don't want to say maybe 20. I, I don't know if he hits that 20 plateau. I think that's a huge achievement, but I think he can be uh, a big focal point up top uh, for Napoli if he, if he does get that service. And Yeah. Uh, if he, oh, sorry, Jenny. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, he needs to get the service. That's it. Because I'm not convinced that he's the kind of guy that can, will create the opportunity on his own or try to create some space for himself. But I, I, I am open to be proven wrong. I really hope I do get proven wrong. Yeah. I don't care if I do because especially that that's why he's being coming in to replace Milik. So he needs to be the upgrade over Milik. For sure. And Lazio, two comeback wins. Two, two, one comeback wins. Milinkovic Savage with a shot. Good save by Sirigu. There's Lazari. Perolo's hit. It deflects in. Marco Perolo for Lazio. They've come from behind to lead again. This is Luis Alberto. Here he is again, and he may have won it for them. Luis Alberto with a enormous Lazio goal and a title race, as it so often does, is right back on the cards. So that's been kind of Lazio's uh, mantra this season: comeback wins, comeback wins everywhere. And um, you know, do, do you guys think that's sustainable? Nine games left of the season. You know, ob- obviously. Over the course of the season, you know, these things even out. Uh, I personally think they could, you know, kind of help them, uh, make it help them, uh, you know, towards the end of the season. But I don't think they're going to have to rely on, rely on it next year because I think teams starting next year are going to realize, you know, they're going to have to shut it down against Lazio late. But now, towards the end of the season, teams are tired. I think they could still kind of rely on it. Do you, do you guys think it's uh, sustainable? Uh, I don't know. It, it, it's a it's a tough call for me. I, I think you know, like we've spoken many many times on this podcast, you know, lots of fantastic team. Uh, you know, their their starting eleven is, you know, you can probably match it with you know any starting eleven you know in, in the league right now. And um, I think it, it's kind of uh, you know playing with fire when you have to come uh, when you have to depend on 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 a comeback. Obviously, like Nick, like you said, uh, you know, two comeback wins in two straight match days, going down one zero. 
uh, both in the Fiorentina and Torino uh, Torino match. So um, I think it's it's a bit risky, you know, really depending on that. Um, obviously, you know, situations in the game do happen, and and you know, you like to see that your team is able to fight back and and have that mentality and be mentally strong to come back in these matches where. You know, especially this season, a lot is on the line, uh, you know, Scudetto implications and, and all of that. So um, I, I personally think they could do it. But I also say that, you know, it is a bit of a risk and a bit of, you know, you are playing with fire a, a bit when, when you depend on, uh, on comebacks. Look, good teams find ways to win. At the end of the there day, that's, that's what it is. If, yeah. whether, you could be down 1 or 2 zero, but a good team is going to fight for that W. And Lazio, yeah, sure. Right now, the past couple of games, they have been in the, I guess, in the comeback position. But um, honestly speaking, I, I wouldn't be worried if I was in what there's like maybe nine games left in the season. Yeah, right. There's about yeah. nine left in the season. It's uh, it's not something to like. There's no panic button to be hit. It's like, oh, maybe you could see it as uh, as them saying, oh, well, we you know, like we're still trying to get the rust out of our gears, but we have the talent to find a way to play for our win condition and that's what they're doing and they need they need to keep on figuring out how to identify those winning positions in every game and they'll they'll be fine now in terms of the depth of the roster if you want to argue like is it bad because their players are gonna be tired maybe but i still think that they're good enough to find ways to win so uh, um it's June. Well, we always, or sorry, it's July today. It's July. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what we always get in July is the um, Mercato Madness, as Adriano likes to call it. It is starting <laughs> again, but it's um, you know deals signed now are only going to be official in uh, in September. So we got two yeah. big ones in the city A this week. We got Hakimi for Inter, and then the Pjanic Artur swap for for Barcelona. Uh, which player do you guys think is going to have the bigger impact on his team? Wow. Uh, Jenny, you want to go first on this one? Uh, there, but, uh, but yeah. No, no, no. It's yeah. a good question. I think maybe because in terms of the position of where they are, I think it's probably going to be the Arthur swap, especially that yeah. uh, it's more for like what the expectations are on Juve. You know, like lots. Uh, sorry, Inter. I know that this year they made a big push in last year's uh, transfer window to become an instantly good team, but they still. They still have like this bit of like a a retool period, I guess, where it's like, okay, yeah, they got the key pieces, but they're not like a team that's been consistently winning like Juve is. Whereas a team like Juve, their expectations is like, okay, Scudetto is like almost a guarantee, but we want to get the Champions League title. So I think Arthur was more of the player that's going to, like, I guess, help out Juve more than Hakimi for Inter. But I could be wrong. That's just my personal opinion on it. No, no, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a fantastic question and just a fantastic debate. Just because I think these are, uh, first off, two obviously you know two young signs coming to coming to the Serie A, which for us you know it's, I would think it's pretty exciting. Um, you know, I think uh, like we spoke about it a bit before, uh, or even last podcast, me and Nicholas, uh, you know, and, and and Daniel, you know, we spoke about you know Arthur coming in, and um, obviously you know you you take out Pjanic, insert uh, Arthur, and and you know he's. He's, you know, seven years younger and, you know, he, he, he came from Barcelona and maybe he'll have, you know, some, some uh, it'll be rough for him to kind of get going uh, maybe from the get-go. But I think uh, it's, for that, it's a positive buy. But I, I will go on the other, on the other, uh, the other signing, Hakimi, uh, since Johnny went with uh, Arthur. I, I will go for Hakimi. I think, obviously, you know, uh, you Kandreva on that right back, right wing back uh, position, uh, you know, it is what it is with him. Uh, you know, sometimes he's... Kandreva, you know, where can make a can cross the ball for for his life depending on it, and then the next week, you know, he's he's Kandrevino, as as we've heard uh, in the past. So I think Hakimi, a uh, young player, uh, you know, he's been uh, fantastic at Dortmund, uh, and I think it it is an upgrade for that squad, for Conte squad, uh, on that right back, right wing back position. However, you know, they do line up come uh, come next year. Uh, so yeah, I think you know it, it is exciting for Inter. I think it is a big signing and. You know, now, you know, I saw before the Fabrizio Romano reporting that, you know, they want Emerson Palmieri for, for the left-hand side, which, again, I don't know if that's an, yeah, I don't know if that's an upgrade for, well, I guess it could be considered an upgrade uh, for the left, uh, left-back left position, but uh, definitely Hakimi on the right-back right, uh, right back position over Kandreva. Maybe Kandreva comes off the bench and, or, you know, they swap, swap time. I don't know, but I think Hakimi is a, is a big buy for Inter. I honestly think, 
you know, in terms of just the uh, kind of aesthetics of the transfer, I think Hakimi could have a bigger impact because this is a player they're bringing in. You know, this is a brand new player. You know, Artur, it's a swap. So, you know, in terms of depth, Juve has the exact same depth at mid- midfield as mm-hmm. they had before. You know, obviously, I think Artur sure. is going to be huge for, for Juve and it's a huge upgrade o- over Pjanic. But, you know, for Inter, you're, you're getting Hakimi and you're still going to keep Kandreva, who's going to be that yeah. depth player. Uh, and then, obviously, it, the position that he's going to play in on that 3-5-2 and that wing-back position, I think, is perfect for him. Uh, he's oh, more absolutely. of an offensive wing-back and uh, it, it fits Conte's system perfectly, so it's going to be exciting. I love it for, uh, you know, if you play foot, uh, there's not many right-back <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, uh, options. options. In <laughs> so it's going to be fun next year in Foot Twenty One, but it, you know it's fun to, for the Serie A. And according to Transfer Market Italia, he's the most expensive African uh, signing in the Serie A. Um, wow, history actually. Mo, Mo Salah left the Serie A for forty two million. This one is forty mm-hmm. million. So it's the most expensive that has been brought in. Um, I wish we could talk about Hellas Verona, uh, as you guys know. I like talking about them because they're a point behind Milan now. Uh, I wish I could talk more about the Europa League, uh, because we have, I think it's six teams, or s- seven teams within uh, six points. Uh, simply, in, or six teams within six points. It's going to be a fun ride to the finish. But I want to do our Player of the Week, our MVP of the Week, and our cards. Uh, what do you guys want to do first? Start with the cards, I think. Okay. We do one, what do you want to yeah. do? One, uh, one card each, right? Yeah, yeah let's do one card. Um, okay, so take it away. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to Parma for their missed chances against the more against Inter. You know that that was a game I think they dominated, especially the first half. Cornelius had a lot of missed chances, as Connor said. Um, you know they they easily could have put the game to bed earlier, and then and then you know you know they they switch off in the last ten minutes, and and Inter comes back to to beat them. You know credit to Inter, credit to uh, yeah, De Vries and uh, Bastoni, but uh, you know Parma. They they have to be kicking themselves a bit, uh, considering all those missed chances. So that's a that's a yellow card for me. This is definitely going to be another yellow. Who wants to go first? I can go first. Uh, I'm going to give a yellow card to Hellas Verona for that meltdown towards the end. Oh yeah, they had a th- yeah, they had a three one lead, and you know what? Give credit to Sassuolo for like a. Mi- this, oh, I'm talking about match yeah. day twenty eight. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm giving credit for them for actually like fighting back for the win, and their shots were well placed. That uh, I don't Roger. think the keeper for for not being able to save some of them. Yeah. Um, but Verona themselves had to play better to to win that game because, especially in the position that they're in, uh, they really need to get every single point that they can, and they just changed it from three points to one. So. Uh, I'm going to give my yellow card to Hellas Verona's performance. Locatelli makes the run. Rogero centers his shot. He has a go. It's inside. It's an amazing goal. Rogero gets the equalizer. Deep in stoppages for Sassuolo. 3-3 the score. What an amazing finish from the Brazilian. It's a late challenge. Surely maybe the first yellow of the match. Idri? Yeah, and just a quick add-on to that, that, that Rogerio go at the end, fucking phenomenal. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, but yeah. that was just ridiculous. And, you know, the excitement after it, 96 minutes, phenomenal. But uh, quickly moving on for me, I, I mean, I was going to, you know, continue on with, you know, my red card being Milan yesterday, which, I mean, you know, I think I, I, I kind of spoke too much about it before, but uh, I'll actually probably give my uh, yellow card to uh, to Lecce in that Lecce-Samp game. Uh, this this game was huge, I think, for the, for the relegation spots. Um, obviously, Sam got the job done, but um, Lecce had a chance, you know, to, you know, to 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 get to claim all three points, um, you know, to kind of uh, potentially climb out of that, actually to climb out of that uh, 18 spot uh, and and put and send Genoa into that 18 spot. So uh, I think that was a missed opportunity for Lecce. You know, obviously there's nine games left, uh, not many more chances uh, to get, uh, you know, for survival. And I think, like we've said many many times, you know, every point counts for all these teams. So. Uh, for me, I'm going to give a yellow card for, for Lecce. I mean, call it as you will, but I think you know this was a missed opportunity for them to to you know to not to really gain ground and, and say you know they're not going to get relegated. But I think it was a crucial uh, a crucial loss uh, against a team that's 
in their same realm of you know uh, you know relegation uh, you know uh, you know teams I guess you can say and just in that realm of you know 16 down so uh, yeah I think just missed opportunity for Lecce uh, for me this week uh, deserves a yellow card and uh, Pete now sees a flash of yellow before his eyes so MVP I guess I'll, I'll take this one off again <laughs> sounds good I have to go with the uh, the legend himself Tommaso Bernie. <laughs> he's my MVP of the week. Yeah, um, he's got a, he got a lot of buzz on Twitter. This guy, <laughs> <laughs> what a guy! He's played zero games for Inter since 2014. He hasn't he hasn't played a, a game in the Serie A since 2012-2013. Uh, um, wow. And he got his second yellow uh, this year against Parma. Second red, red, uh, sorry, red, red. Second red, and um, and it, the first one was against Caledi uh, in, in January. But in, in all seriousness, my, my real MVP, I'm going to give it to um, to Jeremy Boga for his performance against uh, against Verona. He scored two goals um, in that comeback. And, you know, uh, obviously they, they beat Fiorentina on, um, I think it was yesterday. He didn't have as much as an impact, but, uh, you know, he's becoming that impact player in Sassuolo. And, you know, we, we've been giving him credit, but I don't think yeah. um, we've been giving him enough uh, credit and you know he's he's a fantastic player. Him and Berardi this season are just just amazing to watch. And you saw that against uh, against Verona. Now Caputo leaves it for Borga again. Borga the top corner. He gets his double, and Sassuolo are back in this match. You you guys. Uh, so if I can take it away first, uh, Johnny. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to go because I saw who you wrote down and I, I'm not going to go that way. Um, I'm going to go back uh, again to match day 28, um, Udinese Atalanta. I'm going to give my MVP of the week uh, to uh, Luis Muriel. Uh, scored two goals in that game. Uh, you, you know, just been he's been a, just a fantastic addition to the Atalanta team that, um, you know, talk about super sub. This guy has uh, 15 goals on the season uh, in about, I think, 25 or 26 uh, appearances. Uh, nine of them coming off the bench. He's just been uh, lights out. You know, you put him in and he, he usually makes an impact. The goals that he scored in that game were just phenomenal. The, the free kick goal and, and the other one was just just amazing to watch. And, you know, Lu, uh, Muriel has just kind of been, a, a, I feel like, a Serie A fan favorite over these years. And, uh, you know, he's kind of been around the block with, uh, with many different teams now. But I feel like wherever he goes, uh, he makes some sort of an impact. And, you know, that game against Udinese, uh, you know, his two goals, uh, you know, played a big part in that. And, and, and I think he's a player that uh, deserves a lot of credit, um, obviously getting up there in age. And, you know, he's, he's kind of, like I said, been around the block, but definitely in that game. And uh, just going on forward, if he stays with Atalanta, wherever he goes, I think uh, he'll make an impact. But for me this week, uh, Luis Buriel, MVP. You, Jenny? Well, I know I gave the team a yellow card, but I will give Lazovic uh, the MVP for me and the, the goal and assist in that game. Uh, versus Sassuolo, uh, his first his goal was a beauty itself, and that assist was very well placed. So uh, I think uh, Hellas Verona. The only reason why they even got that many goals was because of him. So, uh, so I'm going to give him the MVP of the week. And I wanted to give an honorable MVP to um, to uh, to Muldor from uh, from Sassuolo. I don't know. He, he's just a player I've, I, I kind of noticed against. Uh, Against the um, game against Verona, playing in the yeah. back position, he looked good. Now he's a young kid. Uh, you know, I, I went when I was checking uh, Sassuolo's highlights against Fiorentina. All the all the different uh, you know fans from Turkey because he's Turkish. All the different fans yeah. from Turkey were um, praising ecstatic. Him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they they love doing that. You know, between Modor and and Devin Al eh? Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Like, little um, you know. Uh, honorable mention to him. Honorable mention also to uh, Romelu Lukaku. Did you guys hear what he said uh, at the end of a Parma Inter while he was on no. the pitch? Did you guys see that clip? No. Oh my said? God! Yes, I did. Yeah, he's ah, uh, yeah, 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 I did, I did, I did, I did. I did not. What happened? I'm gonna play it. It, it sucks because the setup. You can't hear it, Johnny. I'll send it to you after. But I'm, I'm gonna play it for our, for our listeners. Victor Moses okay. now. Victor! Oh, Unable to pick out Lukaku. Conte pissed at who again? Absolutely petrified at times. He says, Victor, fucking hell. He oh, yeah, pissed Victor, at Victor, Victor Moses. It. Yeah, Victor and, Moses, that's it. And the clip is so funny because it cuts right away to Conte freaking out on the. On the yeah. They, this is like last kick of the game. They were up 2 1 already. It was, it was so <laughs> funny. Um, 
But yeah, that that uh, I think that'll pretty much do it for us. Unless you guys uh, have anything else you guys want to talk about. Well, another if I can give another honorable mention, um, Ribéry uh, scored uh, a oh, fantastic yeah, goal, goal against against Lazio. Just talk about Twinkle Toes. I was saying Twinkle Toes before for for Dybala and the boxing in Genoa. Uh, honestly, a, a fantastic a fantastic goal uh, at you know at his age and you know just coming back and you know you know with the Fiorentina. Uh, you know, dancing around the defender, the Lazio defenders was for me personally uh, amazing uh, uh, to see. Um, yeah, but uh, besides that, did we touch all the, uh, the the questions? I think pretty much. I mean, uh, Genoa CFC. They uh, he asked, um, you know, uh, who, who do you think our Europa League is going to be? But uh, oh, yes. we pretty much talked about it that last week, and uh, I mean at this That's... point. At this point, it's going to change. It's a race to the finish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be exciting. It's a race for the, yeah, no, it is. I, I think, yeah, race for the, the finish, especially what happened, like Nick, like you like you said, Nick, like it's going to probably change or most probably change, you know, week in, week out. But especially what happened this week, uh, you know, with, you know, Milan dropping, uh, you know, gaining points, but then dropping and uh, Napoli doing the same and Roma shitting the bed in two match days. So <laughs> it's going to be interesting because I think there's either a, like a, it's like what, five points? Uh, gap between Roma and Milan, I, I believe, if, uh, if, if I'm if not mistaken. Roma and Milan is five, uh, and, and then and then Milan and Sassuolo is is six, and then you got so you got Milan forty three, Verona forty two, Cagliari thirty nine, Parma thirty nine, Bologna thirty eight, Sassuolo thirty seven. So it's gonna and be then, fun. Yeah, and then and then the other way, yeah, yeah. At the bottom, Sorry? you got Lecce twenty five, Genoa twenty six, Sampdoria twenty nine. Udinese yeah. 31, Fiorentina 31, Torino 31. So there's uh, th- these races, it, 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 it's going to be fun. There's a month left in the season. It finishes exactly in a month from now. There's nine games left. Uh, yeah. uh, it's going to be super fun. Super excited. No, super excited, honestly. And uh, yeah, I guess I guess that'll do it for us. And uh, once again, want to say a big thank you and shout out to Connor Clancy for coming on and definitely everybody to follow him uh, on Twitter and uh, on Instagram. But uh, for us, you can catch us at The Coucho Guys on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, catch our podcast uh, on all your favorite uh, podcasting platforms. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll be back next week uh, to talk more culture. Thanks for listening. Ciao. Bye. Outro Guys is a weekly podcast by Adriano Donardo, Gianni Delacoli, and myself, Nicholas DiGiovanni. We want to bring Calcio back to its roots in our communities and share stories from around the world about why we're passionate about the beautiful game. You can listen to us anywhere where you listen to your podcasts, including Spreaker, Google Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Mixcloud. Give us your opinion on social media at The Calcio Guys on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. The outro song is The Last Ones by Jazar. Thank you.